John Dee is regarded unfairly by most scholars, variously as an eccentric, a charlatan, or a genius flawed by what was his addiction to the occult. Dee is now seen as one of the leading figures in the English Renaissance. He was certainly one of the most brilliant mathematicians in Europe, a keen supporter of Copernicus' sun-centered universe. And he was a Renaissance man, a polymath whose self-appointed goal was universal knowledge. Dee's interest for us lies more in the details of his life than in his contribution to the history of ideas. He was well known as a great figure of the time, notorious to many because of his reputation as a magician. It is said that he was the model for Prospero, the magician in Shakespeare's Tempest. Prospero's boast that through his magical powers I have bedimmed the noontide sun. This was a boast certainly in line with the powers commonly ascribed to John Dee. He achieved some degree of power as Elizabeth I's astrologer. He selected the most auspicious time for the Queen's coronation in 1558, and he provided her with regular astrological advice, including his insights into her suitors. From his mathematical interest, he became an expert on cartography and navigation, becoming a close friend of the great map maker Gerardus Mercator who followed the reformers in criticizing astrologers, but supporting the principle of astrology. John Dee then became an important advisor in the English voyages of exploration. In 1556, Dee had proposed the formation of a national library. It was turned down by an unimaginative government, so Dee turned his own library into one of the finest in Europe. He provided espionage reports for Queen Elizabeth during his European travels, and used a Kabbalistic symbol which writer Ian Fleming would later convert into the James Bond number 007. Dee was also a pious Christian who criticized Emperor Rudolph II and the King of Poland for their ungodly ways. In 1582, Dee began a series of conversations with angels, conducted through the aid of the medium Edward Kelly. These were conducted in a devout atmosphere, following acts of purification and fasting. D, being well versed in magic, knew that a magician had to have a pure heart and a godly purpose. For daring to talk to angels, though, historians have completely distorted D's work, presenting him as a fool, a charlatan, and a quack. In fact, his conversations with angels were a thoroughly normal part of the 16th century ideological landscape. His crime was to do so as a natural philosopher, almost as a scientist, without the sanction of the church. His mission was to obtain knowledge about the world, rather than guidance on matters of faith. 
For this, he had been damned as a charlatan rather than as one of the most brilliant men of his age. Yet, at a time when communication with the dead in the form of saints, along with prayers to angels, was still an essential part of Catholic religion, to call D a charlatan because he was conducting seances is a gross failure of historical understanding. His real crime was to communicate with angels as an equal, as a humanist, an attempt to gain knowledge from them rather than come to them as a helpless supplicant seeking protection. John Dee was actually engaged in the noblest of humanistic enterprises, the attempt to solve the problems of human strife and misery in 16th century Europe. The final chapter in Dee's research was the conversation with angels. The reasoning was plain. If angels were close to God, then they, of all intelligences in the cosmos, must have the greatest insight into God's mind, but also the best view, from their heavenly perspective, of all of the events on the earth.